Hello, LA232 NDSU students, as well as anyone else who may have stumbled across this video. What I'm going to be showing is a method I like to use to prepare files to be sent to a laser cutter and subsequently cut out and assembled. And I'll be using this as an example, this creature that's kind of an elephant and kind of a koala. Here's a short video of the laser cutter in action. This is cutting out of chipboard, I believe. You can send a variety of materials to the laser cutter, cardboard, corrugated cardboard, chipboard, acrylic, some types of wood. Uh, you can etch into leather, into glass, into metal, all kinds of neat things. So I'm just showing one method of many, in particular, creating a contour model. Contour models conventionally used to show topography. And unless you've actually cut one of these out by hand with an X-Acto knife, you may not fully appreciate just how valuable and useful this type of tool is. So take my word for it. It is quite a time saver. Lots of ways to do this. So my method is really only one of a bunch. There are a few steps that I'll show you that are very important that they are done exactly and in the order that I show you. And there's a handful of things that are really can be done at different times. I'll try to make clear when that is. As a quick overview, what I do is create a shape in SketchUp just because it's really easy. So for example, this shape here was quickly modeled or pieced together with solid groups. And then I scaled it to what its real world size would be. This is kind of important for some other conventions that I'm using for my students in terms of file or material efficiency. So hopefully these cubes will make sense. But I'm just assuming that this real world thing would be somewhere between 15 foot cube and eight foot cube. If I were to bring in, oh, say a person to see the scale, you know, that's about the size it would be. And, you know, I'm thinking maybe just for an, as an example, like a Henry Moore sculpture. Once this thing is assembled and turned into a solid group, that is really important. Anytime you're fabricating something, I definitely recommend that you create it as a solid group or make sure that it is a solid group. If you do this from the start, it's a lot easier to keep it a solid group than it is to try to fix it later on. That is also called a manifold solid in terms of a technical description. And I'll try to elaborate on why that is important as I go through this. Another tool I've used is Dale Martin's wonderful artisan SketchUp tool set. Strongly recommend that you purchase that and use it. You can do really quick and neat organic modeling in SketchUp such as this. That creates a component that looks like this. And once again, after this is placed, I recommend from time to time, make sure that it is staying a solid component or a solid group. This is still at that same scale which is about 10 feet tall and 15 feet wide and 15 feet long, roughly. The next step is to think about the size that this thing will be produced. And let me jump back here. Let me pick that guy. I'm going to copy him. And on this next scene, let's go ahead and paste him right about there. So here's the real world size. Again, just assuming it's some kind of sculptural thing. Here's the finished product size. And in this example, if you take roughly this shape that would fit inside of a 15 by 15 by 15 foot cube, scale it to three quarters of an inch equals a foot, and you've got a limited amount of material that this will fit with that material. And in my example, you'll see in a moment, I've got four sheets of cardboard that are 30 inches by 15 inches. So again, real world, finished, modeled representation. If he was to hold that in his hand, that's how big it would be. This next scene, just to compare, you know, here's four sheets or four representations of 
30 inch by 15 inch pieces of cardboard, which incidentally fit very nicely onto this cutting bed. This particular laser cutting model has a bed of 32 inches by 18 inches, so that's good to know. At this point, you want to be thinking about, do I have enough material to cut this out? If you have unlimited cardboard, you maybe don't need to really consider this. But for my students, I want you to be thinking about efficiency. And a theme throughout this is I was thinking a couple steps ahead. Here is a good way to start that. I can look at this shape and look at these relative pieces of cardboard. And it seems like I could probably create this out of this shape. There are a few other ways to estimate this and conveniently, these steps are also steps you need to do to prepare this to be cut. Well, what are those steps? They are to create slices or sections, a whole bunch of sections, that represent the top edge of the material being cut. Once you've got this, you can select that material, right click, area, selection, and see that it is just under 1100 square inches of material. If you do the math on those four sheets of cardboard, you'd see that that is 1800 square inches. So it seems like we got room to spare. It's about 60%. That is a good percentage at this point to be at. If you are more, it's going to be a tight fit. Also, if you are modeling something that it's real world size is largely outside of these dimensions, you might have some issues. For this example, as long as you stay in these bounds, I'm pretty sure you'll be able to make it work. So just keep that in mind. Well, how do we get to this sliced up piece over here? There's a manual way and you'd be surprised with SketchUp. More times than not, there is a plug-in way. When I first did this a couple years ago, I thought, man, there's got to be a plug-in that will do this for me. And I came across this really cool tool. It's now called Slicer 5. If you Google that, go to the Sketchucation form, you will find a thread where you can download the plugin. You may need to register, but totally worth it. This one is free. And there's instructions here. There's some other people commenting, and there are some examples. A really cool plugin. I don't have the time to show you how to do it, but I would definitely recommend giving this a try. I'll refer back to this as I continue along with this tutorial, but this was created by Tig, really brilliant SketchUp programmer. He has a ton of tools that will definitely help you. Anything you see created by Tig, pretty safe to say it will be helpful. So this will automatically do a lot of the things I'm going to show you how to manually do this. Why do I do it manually? Eh, a couple of reasons. You know, one is it gives you an opportunity to further study and understand as you're doing this. And it's really not that complicated. You'll have a better appreciation and understanding of the size of the proportion and scale and even of the materiality. You will start getting an appreciation and understanding as you work with different materials of how much detail you can get away with and what you can safely represent. This thing is intentionally very bulbous and massy. It doesn't have a lot of thin, dainty parts, which would be hard to model. If I had thinner material or different material, as you create things with the laser cutter, you will start to get different ideas on how to represent them. This one, for example, is created with a slice form method where these pieces have essentially cuts in them that slide together very conveniently. Let's talk about that slicer plugging in again. That will create those shapes for you. So you can do that manually. I'm just going to show you the contour method. Let's jump back and start explaining that. How do we do it? Well, let me make a copy of this guy over here. And I'm using shortcuts. I'm assuming you know SketchUp pretty well if you are watching this. If uh, I'm going a little fast, just go ahead and hit pause. Keep an eye on this toolbar and you will see the tools that I have selected if they are the built-in ones. And uh, for this next step, I'm going to draw a plane. 
underneath this shape. Now keep in mind, this is already scaled down to the size it will be constructed at. So if I take this shape, move it, and I'm hitting my modifier key to make a copy, I'll get that started in the Z direction, and I will type five divided by 32 and hit inches, which is 5 30 seconds of an inch. That happens to be the thickness of the material, the cardboard I'll be using to create this. That gives me one copy. After that is placed, I can type a number and X to make a copy. So if I do 30 X, hit enter, it creates 30 copies. I can see that's not enough to encompass my shape. So let's try 50 X and hit enter. There we go. As soon as I grab another tool, like the select tool and start orbiting, I've lost that little window of opportunity to create additional copies. So keep that in mind. Also at this step, what I'm going to do is an intersect with model, but because each one of these represents the top edge of the material that is being cut, I do not need that bottom one. So let's triple click, hit delete. That one is gone. At this point, I will select that model as well as these shapes, right click and intersect faces with selection. Depending on the complexity of your model, the speed of your computer, etc. This may or may not take some time. So might be a good time to take a break, have a drink of coffee and or other beverage you may be enjoying. Once this is complete, now you just need to delete the unnecessary geometries with the selection tool. I will draw a selection window from right to left, grab that edge. Now I can just hit delete on my keyboard. There's a few other pieces over here, delete, and zoom in. Since this is just a copy of the elephant, I can select that, hit delete, and I'm left with mostly planes or intersections. Now you will notice, it's just a limitation of SketchUp. Sometimes the math doesn't work out where these are converted to planes. So we've got a few floating pieces. Just accept it. You know, nothing is broken. It's just a small error, easy to fix. For example, on this bottom one here, I can grab my line tool and I can see an obvious gap. So I will just connect those. That piece is now complete. Now, if you are picky about the front side or the back side being represented, which you can see by the colors, I don't think it'll matter for this process of preparing these files, but you know, if you're picky like me, you may want to right click and reverse faces. Some of these might be a little bit trickier. Take a look back here. It's not really clear where's the gap in this shape, but if you investigate, keep zooming in, ah, there you go. You may or may not find it. Hopefully it's easier and harder. And once again, let's right click reverse faces. There's a way to make this a little bit easier and it doesn't hurt. Typically I would do this step down the road, but you know what? I'll show you now. Anyway, I'm going to a front view. So there you can see I'm looking straight on everything. Oh, also I've got for what it's worth parallel projection turned on. That makes this part pretty easy. And what I would recommend is grab each layer and group it. And if you have that as a shortcut, that makes this pretty easy because I can just draw some lines and hit my shortcut key, so on and so forth, all the way up. Why am I doing this? Well, let me show you. Let me find one, for example, this one, and I'll do a couple up here. This is actually kind of meditative because you don't really need to think, you can just do it. I have my component edit mode set to hide rest of model. If you go to view, component edit, you will see that option. What does that mean? Well, if I edit a component or a group by double clicking, the rest of the model is hidden. I have that also set as a shortcut. So you can see I can turn that on and off pretty easily. That makes it very nice to fix these types of models because I can go to this layer, double click, grab my pencil tool, and in short order, find all of these mistakes, get them fixed. Now, do you need to delete this? If you want a real accurate estimate, I would recommend only representing the pieces 
that will eventually be getting cut out of your material. You don't absolutely need to. Let's try another one. Let's take this guy. Oh, sometimes you might need to do the zigzag game to find the offending gap. All right, it's in there somewhere. There it is. And so forth. Grab the eraser tool, clean those up. Delete that. Sometimes, just a, another little example that you may encounter. For example, I've grouped this one. I will edit it and I want to delete that part there. Well, if I hit it, oh, that's no good because it's selecting everything. There's a number of things that could be causing this. You might only need to heal an edge or retrace an edge. Sometimes that fixes it, sometimes it doesn't. In this example, it did. So that's one thing you can do. If you can't find it, try this. Select everything, right click, and run the intersect with model again. Sometimes that fixes it. You don't have to get this thing completely cleaned up. If it's still rough, that is good enough to do a really quick estimate. You can select your material or select your geometries, right click and say area of selection. I can see that that is 1054. So that's ballpark. That's pretty close. Another way you can do this is you can paint a material. Find a material that you're pretty sure is not being used anywhere else in your model. Apply it to that shape. And you know what? I'm going to explode this just to get rid of those. I would only explode it after it's fairly cleaned up. Let's find a color again. This is useful if you've got these scattered all around you, your model. It's a little bit easier to find an area. I can right click area, also do by material. So 1200, because I exploded those, it's factoring those in as well. Just a ballpark. That compared against these four sheets, which would be 1800 if you do the math, 1800 square inches, is telling you that it's gonna be pretty close. Now on this example, this is a fairly polished, cleaned up. Each layer, each geometry or surface represents an actual cut of cardboard that will eventually be assembled and look like this. So now I can get a little bit more of an accurate. You don't have to get this far, but you know, if you're picky, I can do an area selection and see that that is just under 1100 or 60% of the material that I'm working with. That is a pretty good percentage. If you get this far and you can find out that your model is reasonably going to take up 60%, I would say that's good. Don't do a lot more. You're going to see that even at this percentage with some very basic shapes, I had kind of a tight fit. Also keep in mind that I am framing all of this in this context. It's slightly larger than an eight by eight by eight cube, smaller than a 15. If your model stays within those constraints, you should be okay. But if you have a really kind of weird shaped model, uh, you might run into problems. But anyway, you've gotten this far. You're pretty sure you have enough material, assuming that you're constrained by that. The next step is to start thinking about how this thing would be assembled. And this is helpful for two reasons. If I were to just cut these out, I could send these to AutoCAD after I move them into different layers, which I'll show you in a moment. But it would be a nightmare because I could cut all these out. None of them would be numbered. I wouldn't know the top from bottom. It would be a pure nightmare to assemble. So I like to think about how would this thing be held together? Glue is one option, but I could also take like a wooden doll, which I've modeled in here. Just bought a wooden doll out of balsa wood, measured it, drew it in, put it in here. And this next scene, you can see that I've positioned these in logical areas where they would pass through. How do I know where those go? Two things that help. Turn on your back edges and go to a top down view and make sure you are set to parallel projection. And I just totally lost my spot. So let's go back to don't do a zoom extents, which is what I think I did. Top down. 
So that dashed line, that's the back edge representation. So I can see where these dowels are placed. The next step is to resize those dowels. They don't need to punch all the way through this model. I can guess fairly easily where these other pieces will go. And I can cap them on these other parts, for example, the trunk and this leg. So once those are positioned, I just scaled these with the scale tool. Okay, why does this help us out? Well, one, it gives you more of an actual support rather than having to glue each one of these. I could theoretically just glue the bottom ones and keep sliding them along the dowels. It's a constantly learning and pivoting process. You will see in a little bit why that, I had a few issues with that, but I was able to adjust and you should be too if you have problems. This also will create cutouts. So let's jump ahead. You can see on this piece, which I will convert to AutoCAD, it shows me each area where those dowels are cut. And what I can do is align those. It's just an alignment thing. So even if I don't put the dowel in there, if I match up the rectangles, it, it works. Let me go back to here. This tool has an option to create an additional line where the previous piece aligns. What does that mean? Well, let's go back here. I didn't use it, but theoretically that would create a line which you could then set to etch. So I could etch a little helper line where I could quickly align these different shapes. Again, the slicer tool, it's something I'd recommend you look into, but the amount of time it would take to learn it it probably wouldn't hurt us to do this manually at least once. That will make you appreciate it. Let's go back. How do I get those? Well, you may guess that I use the intersect tool again. And before I intersect this, let me talk about curves. Curve is the thickness of the laser and that will factor in because the laser cutting tool is so precise. You want to start thinking about thousands of an inch. Those are a factor. These wooden dowels, I took out a caliper and I measured them and they were about 1.94 inches, which is pretty tiny. If I measure them in SketchUp, I can see that I've drawn them. Oops, I need to adjust my units to show more precision. So 0 0.190, why did I make it 0 0.004 less? Well. That factors for the thickness of the laser with cardboard, you know, about 0 0.005, 0 0.004. That's probably what you'll want to consider. So when this gets cut out, the hole will actually be closer to the actual size of this doll and everything will be in theory, a very nice fit. All right, we've got that. I've done another intersect with selection. And once again, Take a breather, have some coffee, or if you don't drink coffee, I guess whatever you like. And that now, if I were to, let's move one of these pieces out so you can see. There you go, very conveniently. What's the next step? This next part, okay, it can be a little bit tedious, but it's really not that bad. I like to call it meditative. I'm going to go to a front view and I will get rid of these dolls because I don't need them anymore. Also throughout this process, I would recommend making copies as you go along these steps because when you are assembling this thing, it will be nice to have this model open. You might want to refer back and you've got, for example, this little ear piece or whatever odd piece you might have for your model and you might not remember exactly where it's positioned because there are no supports, um, but because I've got this model open, it's pretty easy to move around and kind of see where things go. All right, that being said, how do we get from here to this nice laid out mode? Well, again, slicer tool, that functionality is built in for you. You have the option to position the pieces. It's pretty nifty. Manually, here's a pretty quick way to do it. Go to a front view. Assuming all the other steps are done, you definitely want the Dowel cuts if you want to use that process. That step needs to be done before you do this step. That's pretty important. And 
what I'm going to do, I'll do this manually a couple times, and then I will show you why shortcuts are helpful. Select tool, I will grab everything but that bottom layer, grab the move tool, and I want to move this so the next layer is distinctively separate. Notice the space between that layer and that one. Let me pan over, select tool, move tool, repeat the process. It goes pretty quick. Pan over, select tool. I'll just start using my shortcuts. Move tool, pan tool, select tool, and you get the idea. Move tool. Really want to stress too, make sure that this distance is fairly noticeable. We will have an opportunity to organize these later, but I will explain why that's important. It also doesn't matter where these are vertically. I could put this one up here. I could put the next one down here. You will see also why that is not that important in a little bit. But when that's all said and done, you should have something like this. Now, do not do this. I could just be, all right, I'm ready to go. Export 3D model, AutoCAD, boom, done. No, all, all kinds of headaches and turmoil if you do that method. One, you don't want a 3D model. Two, you don't want anything else in here. Even if you have other layers, things are hidden, etc. it will cause a problem. So what I would recommend is delete everything else. That's one. Or do this, get rid of that. Copy just those positioned cuts by themselves and then make a new instance of SketchUp. If you're on Mac, you can just do File New. If you are on Windows, you need to find out where SketchUp lives and click on the icon. Once you are here, go ahead and paste those. So again, first important step is that these are just in a model by themselves. Second, important step. You definitely, definitely want parallel projection turned on. Let me show you why that's important. I did mention it does not matter what Z axes these are in. But if I go to a top down view, visually, it looks like, well, that looks a lot smaller than that. And that looks bigger than that, etc. That's just the nature of the perspective. But if your per parallel projection is on, it doesn't matter. That could be a hundred miles back and it would still look the same size because perspective is off. We are just looking top down. All right, let's, let's review one, make sure just these shapes are in a model by themselves Two, parallel projection has to be on three top down view. Even if I orbit just a tiny bit, that is going to mess things up potentially. So make sure you are set to a top down view Four. Do a zoom extents. Make sure the extents of this model fit in your view. I don't know if that's as important as it used to be. SketchUp used to only export what you saw. I think that may have changed. Important regardless. All right, double check that all of those are set. We're ready to go to AutoCAD. Let's do a file export and you might say, hey, we're building something that's three dimensions. So I want to do 3D model. No, incorrect. You want 2D graphic. Let me step back just a moment. That slicer tool, this guy, as cool as it is. Oh, did I mention too, it will also do slice form. You can do things like it will create the pieces necessary to create that well, little side note, but it does more than what I'm showing you, but it does create the actual thicknesses of the material. So if I, plugged into that plugin. Hey, this is three or uh, five thirty seconds of an inch. It creates this shape. Let's go back to what I was just saying. Top down, zoom extents. And if you were to export a 3D model, that would be problematic. I think if you do a 2D graphic, even though no, this used to be the case, it may not. It creates extra geometries that are just on top of one another. Be aware of it. You know, when in doubt, just make sure everything is flat. There is a way to address that in AutoCAD with a command called overkill. But anyway, I'm wasting time, so let's move along. Export 2D graphic. I will select a really old version of AutoCAD because this is just a really simple model. You know, when in doubt, do around 2000 or 2004. 
and I'm going to call this elephant cuts dot dwg hit export and hopefully you do not get any errors this file we don't really need but this one make sure you save it a lot because you'll probably want to come back here to inspect your visual representation your visual virtual now let's jump over to AutoCAD. The SketchUp part is pretty much done. Aside from this, maybe opening it up later on. Where did I put AutoCAD? All right, here you go. When you open this file in AutoCAD, it will look, hopefully, very similar. And it's a pretty simple model. It consists of a bunch of tiny, unconnected segments. It all dumps it onto layer zero. All that is perfectly fine. But what I would strongly recommend at this point is double check your scale. If you've done everything, as I've shown, your scale should be the same. How do we measure something in AutoCAD? You type DI and hit enter. And it doesn't hurt to have your snaps turned on for this. So I will click that, click there, click there. Whoops, I did it. Well, there you can see, let me do that again. Click there, click there, 0.190. Hey, perfect, that's the exact same size. I could actually close this because, you know, I guess let's say this, if your scale is off, you've got to either type units and adjust your units, or you need to scale this proportionally to get to what you need. Let's go ahead and open up this laser template. Now, I'll give this to you if you need it. Otherwise, I think you can search for NDSU laser cut template. It doesn't really matter if it's configured for a certain material, that's easy to fix. But what is important is that you see this boundary and these numbers. This represents the cutting bed of the one of two laser cutters that NDSU has, and it's a fairly standard model. It's also configured to ignore everything outside of this box, which works well because as I prepare these files, I like to just have everything in one file, and all I need to do is move it into place, hit print or plot or send to laser cutter, cut it out, and move it out, move the next piece in. At this stage, I would strongly recommend you save this to something logical. So you're not saving over the template. The other thing that I'd recommend, now I've got my border unlocked. When you first open this, it'll probably be locked. I have mine unlocked. I'm going to position that or set that to be my current layer, is to virtually represent the material, how do you do that? Well, let's do this. Let's turn on the ortho mode, that will help. And I'm going to type P line, hit enter. I'll start here and I'm going to type 30, enter, 15, enter, 30, enter, and 15, enter. And I'll hit escape. Now I can do a copy, grab that, move it over here and do that a couple of times. This works well. Like you're probably going to have material ready and you know what you have to work with. This just helps the process of staying efficient and whatnot. So let's turn on my layers again, which is just layer. And let's freeze that and set this to be cut. What's the next step? Well, I'm going to jump ahead here. The next step is to insert. You can type insert and hit enter, and you should get something like this. When you first insert these, they will be inserted as one block. So you will want to type explode, they will be exploded, and then you want to set them to the correct layer. I have all of these set to my cut layer, which I can see here. And at this point, here's another very important procedural step. I could probably say, oh, let's just start moving these into place, right? So I'll grab that, grab that, move it down here and go all the way down the line. Problematic, do not do that because these are still a bunch of tiny little segments that will be very much of a headache. And it could potentially cause problems with the laser cutter because the laser cutter might cut that piece and then jump across the board and then cut this piece, etc. So this next thing, it's not as procedurally important. You can really do this at the last step 
or you know, right now, I'd recommend doing it sooner than later. That is a polyline edit, and we will turn all of these polylines into joined polylines or all these segments. How do you do that? Well, type P D I T, hit enter. I want to do M for multiple. Select these objects. Keep an eye on my command line at the bottom of the screen because it will give you hints. Hit enter. Now it's asking me, okay, what do you want to do? Convert these to arcs, uh, etc. Y for yes, hit enter. May take a long time. No, it won't. Hit yes. This is what we're looking for. When you see this screen, you want to hit J for join. So I'll hit J, hit enter. Fuzz distance, you want to be zero. Hit enter once again. Let it think. And when it's all said and done, you can hit escape. What do we just do? And you will use that tool a lot, not just for this polyline edit is really helpful. It has taken any connected segments and join them. So that by itself makes this a little bit easier to move things around and otherwise continue along. So what's the next thing? Well, let me jump ahead just to show you the finished piece or the cut ready piece. Here you can see I've taken everything I need and I've positioned them in a little bit tighter of a fit that I was hoping. Again, this is only 60% of my material, but I had to rotate pieces and kind of nudge them and shoehorn them and even use some of these voids to cut out the other ones. But notice I've got them numbered and those numbers are set to a layer that will be subsequently set to etch. So when all these things come out, everything is conveniently numbered. And you can see here, I've got a stack of parts but if you look really close, you can see that they are numbered, which makes this a little bit easier to put together. How do we get to that step? Let's go back to this one. And I've just completed my polyline edit. The long way, well, we've got three options here. One is to use that slicer tool. It's really cool, but again, I want to stress the learning curve is a little steep, so again, recommend doing it manually first. The two sub options are, I could just manually go through each layer. For example, this is layer one. I want a 111 put on it here, 222, et cetera. Also, this is why I wanted you to have these visually distinctive. All right, so let's type text, hit enter. Let's, uh, let's zoom in and get our first one done click here and my height, I want one eighth of an inch. So I'll just go ahead and type that and hit enter. And if you look at my command line, what's the rotation angle? Zero is fine. And now I can start typing. And I know it's one mistake, but that's all right. So I could type one and hit enter and repeat the process and go to enter all the way down the road. Here's a much easier way. And I'm stringing together a couple of commands. Little caveat here, I'm using a command not available on the Mac version of AutoCAD, tcount. I apologize, you will need to probably hop on a Windows machine. Just know that tcount does not work on a Mac when I start talking about that. Small error, I created this thing on the wrong layer. Let's fix that. I'll do a quick properties layer. That should be on my numbers layer or just another layer. If you're using the template, it's probably called etch. And you know what? It doesn't matter what this says. So I'm going to put a pound symbol instead for this next process. What's next? Okay, let me hit escape. You'll find out that you hit escape a lot in AutoCAD. And I'm going to type copy, hit enter, select my objects, hit enter, specify my start point, and I'm going to turn off my snaps and these other ones to make this easier. Hit enter. And then you just go down the road. Hopefully your mouse is set to pan so you can just hit your middle wheel button. And for each numbered layer, so all of my ones will get a symbol, all of my twos will. These don't need to be in any specific spot. And in fact, if they're in a slightly different spot, it will make the visual assembly of this thing e easier. So let's, I'll just stop there. Just assume I'm going all the way across, hit escape. And 
at this point, okay, well, how do we get all these numbered? This is where T count is super duper helpful. Type T count. You know what? I'm going to turn this other one back on so you can see what I'm typing up here. T count. As most of these tools, there's all kinds of sub settings you will need to set. Hit enter. Select your objects. Well, I can select everything because this only works on text entities. And you can see that 17 were found. I created 17 copies. If I had them all the way across, I think there'd be like 46. Hit enter to move to the next step. Sort selected. How do we want to number these? Left to right or top to bottom? Left to right is X. If you remember your graphs, I guess, in algebra. Top to bottom is Y. So I'm going to sort these by the X. I can click on it or hit X. Numbering increment. Start and increment. One to one. Well, that means it will be one, two, three, four, five, etc. If I did one, two, it would be, or let's say two, two, that's easier. It would be two, four, six, eight. Pretty straightforward. I'll just do the default. And do I want to override that text? Do I want to add it to the beginning, to the after, etc.? I could have said cut, typed cut. And then if I did prefix, it would be one cut, two cut, three cut, etc. I will just do overwrite. Hit enter. Make sure that is confirmed and take a look. Ah, very nice. Everything is nicely numbered. And because I very thoughtfully positioned these in the X direction in SketchUp, it's all pretty good. Now we need to get these numbers on these other parts below. So I want everything on the first layer to have a one. What do we do? We do the copy tool. Copy, click, hit enter, click to start, click to position, click to position, and hit escape if you're done. Okay, time to talk about some AutoCAD agility. I'm not one to brag, but I like to think of myself as somewhat of a AutoCAD Ninja with the mouse. And I'd like to share with you how you can become one as well. It takes practice. Here's a really good example or situation where we can practice. Let me show you something really quick. If I were to type a command, well, first of all, I'll do this the slow way. I'm going to type copy, hitting enter, select the tool, hitting enter, and I'm moving my hand, click, hitting enter. Oh, this is tedious, especially if you've done this a few times. Oops, I, I messed up there. Copy, enter, click, enter, click, 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 and escape. All right, there's lots of typing. I need to change something here. I need to go to options. I need to set this to what your computer is probably like. So just ignore this. Not seeing anything. All right. Typically, when you right click, it brings up this context menu, which has all kinds of useful things that you might do. One of them is you might want to repeat that last command. So if I do copy, hit enter, click to select, hit enter, click to start, click to place, the left click is really a tool input button. Hit escape. Now, if I right click, I can be, hey, neat, I can just repeat that copy again. That saves me so much time. I don't need to retype it. Enter, click to start, etc., etc., and so forth. Here is a better way, I think. I would strongly recommend this. I call this old school AutoCAD. If you right click, assuming yours is set to the default, go to options, click on the user preference, and then do right click customization and turn on time sensitive right click. What does this mean? If you right click, it will, it will register the same thing as the enter or the return key. If you still want to bring up that context menu, you have to hold it down for a quarter of a second and that will happen. This will make it much, much faster. Hit apply and close, hit okay. All right, just to, out of fairness to our Mac users, you want to right click, go to preferences, click on general and click this top button here. That does the same thing. What does that do? Well, with your mouse, your left click is still the tool key or the tool operation button. Your right click will act as the return key 
as well as the repeat key depending where you are in the process. So I'll do that same thing that I just did, but this time I will do it with less talking and more just how Matt uses AutoCAD. Type and copy, click, right click, left click, left click, left click, left click, right click to confirm, right click to repeat, left click, right click, click, left click, left click, left click, pan while I'm in the middle of this, and so forth. This is a really easy way to fire through not just this tool, but basically any tool in AutoCAD. Do it slow at first. I don't know if YouTube has a slow down option, but notice I'm left click, left click, left click, left click, right click to confirm, right click to repeat, pan, select, right click to confirm selection, left click, left click, left click, left click, etc. So that will allow you to quickly go through this whole process and it should only take a few minutes. Now we are almost ready for the really fun part of moving all of these down here. What I'd recommend before you do that is group each individual thing with the group command. Type group, hit enter, select your shape, hit enter. Or if you're mastered that, that mouse tool, I can just right click to repeat that, right click to confirm, right click repeat. So I'm really doing the group command rather quickly using nothing but the mouse. Right click confirm, right click to repeat. And maybe I miss the uh, the context menu. Well, all you need to do is right click and hold it for a quarter of a second and that will come up. Once that is all done, and I'll hit escape to boot out, each one of these is very conveniently in its own little block. And let's just assume I've got that done all the way down the board. What's the next step? Well, you could just start placing them. It really helps to start grouping these logically by shape. Try to cluster these first, really be as efficient as you can, then take those clusters and move them into position. Let me jump to another window to explain why that is a little bit easier. Oh, so this one I've already started. You can see that I've moved these ones up to here and my, my little spotlight isn't working, apologize for that. But I can type move, oops, if I can spell, move, quickly select that group, right click, and once again, because I've got these shortcuts, I can do all of this with the mouse. Oh, let's see, let's quickly grab some of those ones at the bottom, get those over here. And because they're all numbered very conveniently, it'll be easy to reassemble these. These larger ones, you know, maybe I wanna do that. You know, that's a little unique, so I'm gonna put him up there. But you get the idea. You just want to position these in a way that makes sense. You can see over here, I've, I've rotated those and kind of nudged them together. And when it's all said and done, after I've got these grouped, let's see here. Let me just move this one guy down. So I'll put that one, whoops. So like that one doesn't quite fit. So I'll type rotate, select, right click, Type 180, whoops, 90? Oh, now I'm in SketchUp mode. Rotate, I only wanted that to be 90 degrees. Move, now I can position that and nudge it some more. When it's all said and done, it should look something like this one here. If you get this far, you can take it to a lab tech, or if you're certified to use the laser cutter, you can sit down and do it yourself. It should be very cut friendly. There are a few power and speed settings that you can configure. What's really important is that your, your numbers are on an etch layer. If these were all not, eh, you could fix it, but it's easier just to make sure they're done. You know, if these were all on layer zero, and at this point I wanted to change them, it's a little bit trickier. But I would sit down at the laser cutting computer I would type move. Keep in mind that these boxes that I drew to represent my material are now locked. I'm going to turn on my snap and I will move from this corner to this corner. Notice none of that extra stuff is coming along for the ride. Place my material. 
send it and listen to the music of the laser cutter as it slices out your pieces. Assembly I won't really talk about. If you've done all of that, it's fairly easy to put together. But remember I said I had a small problem. What was it? Well, to make a long story short, I accidentally scaled some, but not all of these at like 98%, which was enough to throw off these squares. So halfway through putting this together, I had to bust off my wooden dowels and just use those for an alignment tool. But you know what? It still worked out. It was still pretty easy to complete and end up with this thing here. I hope that makes sense. I jumped around a little bit. As always, if you have questions, let me know. I will do my best to help you out. Good luck and have fun. I hope you make something pretty cool. I'm sure you will.